This podcast episode is sponsored by Promethean. With more than 20 years' experience in education, Promethean is a global leader in education technology. The Active Panel Elements series of interactive flat panels combined with Promethean educational software offer a truly collaborative and connected approach to teaching and learning through EdTech. Promethean Active Panel, designed to save valuable teacher time and improve learning outcomes. Learn more about Promethean at www.prometheanworld.com forward slash GB. The What Matters in EdTech series is produced by the EdTech Podcast and supported by BET. For anyone who doesn't know, BET is the first industry show of the year in the education technology landscape, bringing together over 800 leading companies, 103 exciting new EdTech startups, and over 34,000 attendees. People from over 146 countries in the global education community come together to celebrate, find inspiration, and discuss the future of education, as well as seeing how technology and innovation enable educators and learners to thrive. The BET 2020 seminar program is CPD accredited and provides over 300 hours of workshops, talks, and discussions addressing issues around SEND and inclusion, future tech and trends, well being, innovation, skills, and empowering teaching and learning. In fact, all the areas this podcast series covers across six episodes. To find out more and to register for free, go to www.betshow.com. You know, teachers are, are in the business of teaching and learning, and I think they really need to see what it means for them, and, and not just hear in abstract terms about the importance of technology, but to really see how they can embed it in their practice in a, in a pedagogically meaningful way. Hello everyone and welcome to this fourth episode in our series What Matters in EdTech, supported by BET. This series is all about the things that matter in education and how and when tech might help. Over our six episodes, we will be looking at themes that shape BET's conference programme in 2020, namely innovation, empowering teaching and learning, skills and past episodes including on SEND, future tech and trends and well-being. We'd love to hear from you. Tweet us using the hashtag EdTechPodcast and Bet2020. Welcome back, everyone. If you're listening to this, it's at least 2020 now, which is very futuristic at the time of recording. From all of us at the EdTech Podcast, we wish you an absolutely superb new year and best of luck with all you hope to get done. This week's episode is all about empowering teachers and learners. In this episode, I speak to a range of school leaders, professional development specialists and techie teachers about the conditions to empower teachers and learners. We talk teacher time, flexibility and trust, evidence-based practice relevant to particular school context and how to best implement tech that supports teaching and learning. First off, let's meet our guest this week. Um, so, my name is Stephen Holden, as you've said. I'm the head teacher of Tottington Primary School and I'm now in my eighth year there. Uh, Tottington is a small village outside of Bury in Greater Manchester and is perfectly placed to uh, in between kind of the rural community and the, the inner town community. So, it has a real diverse mix of children. Uh, the school itself has been on an incredible journey over the last 10 years. Um, it In the past, it's been satisfactory over time um, and then fell into requiring improvement and was sliding down the the league tables in every way. And I think that the best way that I could describe how it felt when I arrived there is it was very clear that children from the local estate and families that that live nearby were walking past our school uh, to get to other primary schools, the ones that Mm -hmm. they saw better. And um, heartbreaking, really, because... Every child deserves to go to their local primary school and it be as uh, the best it can be. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll get to unpick some of the, the way that we did that as a team, but largely using the, the same staff team that, that was there when I started. We're now good with outstanding features. We're top 5% nationally 
We've been at the top of the local league tables now for the last four years. Um, those are the statistical measures, but more importantly, it's the place to be. It's seen in the local um, and almost national community now as a forward-thinking school that innovates, um, but most importantly, has a high-quality education, and we just have fun. The kids and the staff and the stakeholders um, love being around the place, and I'm very proud of that, and it's it's been a journey that we've all been on together. So I do feel now we – I think when you when you start to – um, to move a school forward you have to look inwards to begin with and you have to get your own things right we're, we're very um, fortunate now to be in a position where we're looking outwards and we're telling our story to people like yourselves and and going sharing what we've done and hopefully inspiring other people to to make that same journey So Sarah, um, what would be amazing is if you're able to just quickly introduce yourself and a little bit about who you are and what you do for our listeners. Okay, so um, I'm the director of London Connected Learning Centre. Um, we have a, a centre in Clapham in South London and we work with um, hundreds of schools kind of across sort of London and, and, and the South East and we have children and young people that come daily to our centre to take part in um, digital activities. So, you know, one day that might be kind of um, programming activities or robotics or animation or, or filmmaking. We run professional development from the centre, we run conferences, but we also go out into schools a lot and actually work alongside teachers and, and young people in schools and do professional development in school as well. We're involved in quite a bit of uh, research, so we've been involved in um, some Education Endowment Foundation research projects, working closely with um, Rosendale Research School on a big metacognition trial at the moment. Um, so we're, and we also do technical support services for schools. So we're kind of um, all things digital. Um, so we'll support schools in their digital strategy, their CPD, um, activities for, for young people um, and, and getting their, their infrastructure right. So kind of, yeah, uh, a bit of a sort of like uh, helping hand with all things digital. Fantastic. And you were telling me before that you are, were previously a primary school teacher. Yes, yeah, so I'm a primary school teacher by by background, um, and then then got into uh, actually working in, in in family learning and supporting families and um, and adults uh, often in terms of digital skills, and then um, became director um, at the Connected Learning Centre. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to have Kat Scutt, uh, Director of Education and Research at the Chartered College of Teaching on the line. So welcome, Kat. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you this morning? Yes, doing oh. very well, thank you. Um, so Kat, to kick off, please could you introduce yourself and the Chartered College to our listeners? Yes, so I'm Director of Education and Research at the Chartered College of Teaching, which means that I oversee our work around teacher development and uh, research engagement and also our publishing activity. Um, the Chartered College of Teaching is all about raising the status of the teaching profession and supporting teachers to develop and to really feel like they have a voice in their profession as well. Um, we're the equivalent of things like the Royal Medical Colleges for different medical professions. Um, we're only just nearly three years old now, so we've made quite a lot of progress in the last three years in what we're doing, but we've still got more and more that we're doing over the coming years to support teachers. So my name is Deirdre, Deirdre Hudson. I'm originally from Dublin in Ireland and I'm actually based in Brussels in Belgium. And I work, uh, like you mentioned, at the education department of the European Commission. So I work specifically on the digital education team. So we work across Europe with European Union member states and with partner countries. And we're looking at really twofold aspects of digital education. So how we can equip learners and our educators with digital skills that they need and also how we can use uh, technology to support pedagogical practice as well. Fantastic. And, and just to make life extra easy for yourself, you're also studying a master's in digital education. Is that correct? That's right. Absolutely. In my so-called free time. So, yeah, I'm <laughs> nearly there with, a, with my master's with the University of Edinburgh on digital education. So just wow. about to start on my thesis. 
And so will you be coming over for a graduation ceremony at some point? That's the idea, Sophie, all going well. Yeah, yeah, that's the end goal. Yeah, just have to get the pieces out first. But yeah, no, it's okay. I'm about to start and I'm excited about the topic I'm writing about. Um, It's on computer science, curricula and secondary education. And last but not least, it's Rachel Ashmore, Head at Promethean Academy and Senior Education Consultant at Promethean. Um, I'm an ex-primary school teacher, so I started um, my career in teaching and I've been with Promethean now for 17 years and um, I work widely across the international region for Promethean, which is a global ed tech company. And I've spent the last 17 years in a variety of roles, supporting schools in getting the best from their ed tech solutions and developing good practice within the classroom. To give us a sense of where we are in the UK with regards to empowering teaching and learning, here's Kat Scott, Director of Education and Research at the Chartered College of Teaching, with a general overview. When you first sort of mentioned this as the topic for this uh, this episode, I started thinking about this quite kind of deeply because I think there's a, in some ways, there's a sort of um, a, a conflict here that actually, in theory, the way in which the system is set up means that schools and teachers within those schools do have a relatively large amount of autonomy around approaches to teaching and learning. And if that's what we're thinking about in terms of empowerment, I think that that, that sort of should be the case. And yet, I think that for many teachers, they would say that they don't necessarily feel hugely empowered or that they have autonomy uh, or agency around what they're doing and Mm. that's less to do with what policies strictly say or what what is imposed by government and more to do with a sense I think of how the accountability system works and expectations that that can drive Um, I think we know any teacher that you talk to will probably uh, be very aware of of the impact that Ofsted has had um, both on on schools but on individual teachers within those schools as well largely more to do with perceptions of what it is that Ofsted wants or what's expected mm. than necessarily what Ofsted themselves are actually saying. But this kind of sense of uh, of the importance of Ofsted and the way in which it can impact on teachers' careers and on school leaders' careers in particular, the way in which it can impact on schools can mean that there's a sense of, oh, well, what we need to do what Ofsted wants us to do. And that can lead to teachers and school leaders feeling disempowered, I think. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. And and also um, perhaps a lack of time is what I've heard a lot as well. Yeah, and I think those two things are not necessarily unrelated, actually, that um, what can happen is that, that that kind of sense of nervousness around accountability can lead to practices that aren't really that helpful for teaching and learning, but add to workload. So things like um, triple marking at one point, uh, mm-hmm. regular sort of data drops and things like that, which are sort of more useful for monitoring than they are for um and even then probably not very useful for monitoring either but they're perceived as being more useful for monitoring than they are for actually driving teaching and learning and that can increase teacher workload without making them feel that they have time to think about what they're doing what they're doing that's actually useful for for uh, pupil outcomes so um there's a real kind of challenge to overcome that to to say actually no what is it that we need to do to be empowered to do the right things for our students to drive teaching and learning forward rather than Uh, the sort of default being what is it that Ofsted are expecting to see when they come. So with this in mind, what are some of the conditions needed to empower teachers and learners further? As with every episode of the podcast we produce, creating a culture of trust and a network of support is essential to any best practice. Honestly, and this theme will come across in, in any pitch or any conversation I'm ever asked to do, doesn't matter what the title is, I could, I could tell you the same two words, and that's culture and ethos. Mm. And they're big words that are thrown around, and you can buy books on it, and you can, you know, you, you can buy things in to help you. You can even have a strap line for your school. Um, none of that really matters. It's, it's about how you galvanize a group of people to have a common purpose and to be well-respected. Um, I guess in Tottington's journey, it all had to start with one person, and you know, for the leaders that are listening to your podcast, they have to realize that culture and ethos isn't something that you buy in or that you can enforce. It it has to start with the way that the main leaders, it might be one person, it could be an SLT team, it could be a group of CEOs or executive heads, but the way they conduct themselves and the, the philosophy that they put forward first is the most important. Um, I hope that what I'm about to tell you about Tottington's journey does 
ring true for, for other settings. Obviously, I can only talk about my own, but um, for me, starting in um, Tottington Primary School, I was a teaching deputy um, in summer 2012. And by the September in 2012, I was leading a large primary school uh, with over 70 staff. And over those six weeks, I didn't gain any more knowledge. Um, there wasn't anything miraculous that happened. I was the same person. I guess what I did have to think about is who I wanted to be uh, as a leader and stick to it and show everybody what that was. And I think what, what I wanted to be was that there was that there was no hierarchy in, in the school. I mean, obviously, there's, there's hierarchy in decision-making and accountability, but not in anything else. So I made it clear that we do things together. Uh, I don't have letters after my name on the letterhead. I don't have my own parking space on the car park. I am like everybody else. I'm just a person that has a little bit more accountability. And I think to start my journey as headship with people understanding that we're in this together and that accountability does end with me, but is everybody's responsibility to, to get things mm. moving. Um, I, think that, I think that really worked. I, you, you live through education with, and you hear certain things. So I'd heard um, when I was an NQT, I, w- I was told um, not, not to smile till Christmas, yeah. um, you know, so that children know that you've, I mean, so, so if, if you build yourself based on fear, then, then you've decided the person that you want to be in you might get the same results out of children or out of your staff, but I knew the person I wanted to be. And um, I remember I heard a head teacher uh, at a head teacher's conference when I was, when I was um, starting my headship career who said, I'm not here to make friends. And I thought that was a really bold statement because I understand it. You don't need, you don't need friends, but you need people to respect you and understand you. And if you want your staff to run through brick walls for you, if you want to go into battle together, which is sometimes how it feels in a, in a primary school, then you need people to be right behind you. Mm. And you don't get that camaraderie through fear. You get that camaraderie by doing things together. So I guess what I'm trying to say is culture and ethos starts from the person that you want to be and the way that you portray yourself day in, day out. And if, and if you were Sorry. building that culture and ethos from a position where perhaps fear had been the driving force before, how do you go about develop and sustain that idea of the leader that you wanted to be and show others? So were there particular kind of initiatives or is it just over time people got, got to trust the fact that that's who you were and you know, it wasn't going to te- change anytime soon? I think um, one of the... One of the successes, really, of, of those early days was the use of your um, inset days or training days, whatever you want to call them. It can be staff meetings or mm. events, because um, I, I have a philosophy now that's grown from my experience at Tottington that those times when you're all together, particularly if you can get the whole staff together, and I mean every single person that would ever come into your building in one room, use the opportunity, not for policies, not so that you can understand how you're going to deliver maths this year or the new behavior policy. I think you can do that through staff meetings in a more effective Mm. way during the working day. When you have all your staff together, that's the time for, for people to understand your vision as a person, what you think is important, but more importantly, to have a look at how incredibly lucky we are to work in education. So it started off just by me wanting to show people what my philosophy was, but has now become um, what we do every year is we, I, I deliver my inset training, my, my, my inset training days around current theories of thinking of education and, and celebrating what it is to be in education, not looking at the fine, at the, the small details of, of policy and, the more I did that and the more I opened up people's eyes to the, the research that's out there, and we'll happily talk later about how we plug into current research and current thinking. Mm. But when I started that, I think it opened the staff's eyes to the wider world of education. And more importantly, that, that I wanted to make sure that we were at the forefront of that. And if you can do that, I, I said it earlier, if you decide who you want to be and you let people see it, but then you stick to it relentlessly. There's nothing worse than inconsistency for having people um, make it make a judgment about. Oh, I knew, I knew he couldn't keep it up, or um, it, it can't be true because he, he only does it sometimes and not the others. That the consistency of, of how you are as a person and the, the messages that you deliver 
have been the key really for, for turning around those doubters and for making people who have been fearful of the hierarchy. It's hard to say, you, you see it in business, but I've seen it now in, in, in schools where the hierarchy is used as a way of exerting power or mm. telling people what to do. And, you know, you, I, I do feel you can get the same results in a school through fear, but it's it's not the way that I would want to run my school. It shouldn't be the way that anybody that's put in front of children should be made to feel. I think, you know, every teacher, I mean, every, I'd like to think most leaders started off as teachers and all you would want was for your children to be happy in the classroom. And that doesn't change when you become a leader. It's just that your audience is different. You now have teachers and teaching assistants and site managers and business managers and catering teams that deserve to be valued, deserve to feel that they're part of something incredible and being consistent and delivering that message to them, telling them how amazing they are at every opportunity um, is, is the way that we've made sure that anybody that doubted it, because I think schools... We've seen it all before. There's, there's a lot of people in education mm. that, oh, we've seen this before, it's coming round again. But actually, change is part of the job, isn't it? If you, if you wanted something that stayed the same, then education's not, not the job for you. But being part of that change, I think, is the key, and making people feel valued within that is the way that you can allay some of those fears, I think. I think, um, I mean, there's lots of literature now, isn't there, about mm. what may effective um, professional development and certainly I think our experience here at um, London City kind of backs that up in terms of having a kind of community of practice really so those um, kind of professional networks so something that we really like to do here at our centre is to um, bring teachers together uh, so that they are sharing their practice as well as receiving input from us as the the kind of technology experts so for example we run um maths science english modern foreign language forums for teachers where it's they're gathering together to talk about their subject and subject specialism but they're also here because we're all about technology um to receive kind of input and expertise around how digital technologies might be able to help them in that in that subject so i think that works really well and because as i mentioned we work with a a kind of intensely with kind of group of partner schools i think getting to know school needs and understanding school development plans and being able to really match professional development to specific school context so yeah mm. there's, there's something back on the context so kind of the context of the individual teacher um, their subject their phase um, their school their needs and then it's almost like finding um, yeah what, what what's the kind of problem that they want to solve and then how might the professional development and in our case the kind of digital technology, professional development, how might that support them in in finding that solution? Creating the space and time necessary for professional development and or to implement any tools or services identified to improve teaching and learning is also essential. I think in order to empower teachers to get the very best from their students, the first thing that we must do is to ensure that they've got access to high quality teaching solutions that they that work for them. Um, And that includes adequate connectivity and, of course, access to training, professional development and some sort of support and time as well. Time is really important Mm. to be able to explore these solutions. Um, And that's a really common theme across technology in the classroom. I find that it, it does take time to embed any new solution or practice properly into the classroom. And that's exactly what needs to happen in order for it to have a maximum impact on teaching and learning and therefore raise standards. I think I, time time and time for professional development is probably mm. one of the, the, the biggest barriers. Um, I think having kind of a coherent digital strategy within individual schools. So I guess, you know, a, a lot rests on the shoulders of, um, of school leaders who have um, so many pressures. But I think... Um, getting things right in terms of what the strategy is in individual schools Mm. 
And that's kind of from the curriculum and pedagogy point of view, but also making sure that there's the, you know, there's the robust infrastructure um, and um, and resources and, and, and tools um, on which students and, and teachers can work. Um, so I think those those are some of the barriers. And then I think just, you know, that there are tensions in terms of our, our curriculum and the requirements of the curriculum. And then if you like, the needs of, of society and um, the workplace and kind of what young people need in their futures. And maybe there's, maybe there's a bit of a disconnect at the moment between mm. how, how kind of well skilled digitally young people need to be to kind of cope with their lives and, and careers. And yet there is a bit of a disconnect at the moment with, with the curriculum in terms of helping them in that preparation. So yeah. If if you could make a small tweak to the curriculum, what would it be? Um, oh, I'll have to think about that one. <laughs> um, I think having some ex- more explicit mention within the different subject in the national curriculum as to where technology can support. Right. So, for example, I mean, in, in geography, there is kind of explicit um, mention around um, kind of like um, use of use of data in design technology. There's, there's mention of, um, of technology. But actually, I think it would be useful to have mention of digital technology in the different subjects. So, you know, when we're when we're thinking about English, actually thinking about um, digital literacy and being critical about information. Mm-hmm. Um, I think maybe that would help help teachers like give it a, a legitimacy, but also kind of a pointer because I think otherwise, it, when you read the curriculum, it can look like digital isn't relevant. Um, and it's kind of guesswork, and that's again, as you mentioned, from time poor teachers, it's quite stressful to sort of think, you know, am I, am I interpreting this in the in the right way or a way that's going to be useful? And finally teachers are natural innovators give them the relative freedom to unleash their entrepreneur what you what you'll find from from a lot of the things that, that i'm saying this morning is none of this will work unless you have um trust uh, within your team and that, that we through, through everything that we've done um starting from who i wanted to be and then you know that permeating out across my slt and now across the whole team about um why we're here and why we do the things that we do another massive part of what's been built in is that there's no fear of failure that every idea that comes in in a staff meeting in a monday briefing um through now this 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 project-led idea that there's no fear of failure at, at my school because everybody understands that their ideas will be considered they might they might not stick some will some won't um but i think if everybody knows that their ideas will be considered sensitively and that there's no fear of 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 failing with an idea and again that leads from the top i I make it quite clear that um as the head teacher there that any any idea has to come from everybody because i'm i have the title and i've got something on my door that says i'm the head teacher but i'm not the best educational thinker in the building it depends on what we're doing at that particular time so i'm prepared to show that some of the ideas that i've had uh hadn't worked and I think if you lead that idea from the top that everybody makes mistakes, that people do start to feel comfortable in um, having ideas and they trust that they they won't be laughed at and then they won't be um, thrown to the side. So all of these things have to come from a place of trust. But how are schools and colleges assessing what makes a difference to teaching and learning and evidence-based practice? And how important is contextualising this research? So I think there's probably two or three things that I think are really interesting um, in the sector at the moment. The first is this increasing focus around evidence-informed practice, around the use of research. Uh, The reason that I think that's really important is that I think it's increasingly giving teachers more confidence to articulate what they're doing, to be able to explain why they're taking the approaches that they are, uh, rather than this sense of kind of following fads or following demands of Ofsted, that actually their knowledge of what really powerful teaching and learning approaches look like uh, is increased. And therefore, rather than than kind of um, just doing what the teacher in the next classroom is, they're able to make the right decisions and they're able to explain why they're doing those. I think we've got a fantastic teaching profession who have been doing a brilliant job, but 
there's a greater ability now for teachers to feel confident and explain what they're doing, which is really mm. powerful in them feeling more empowered, feeling more like they have a say, like they have control over their own practice. So I think that's kind of the first one. I think in a sense that kind of focus on research is also informing policy to a level that's really helpful. So things like uh, a lot of the work that Rob Coe has done arguing around um, the sort of lack of validity of graded lesson observations suggesting that it's really not a, a useful thing to be doing that actually you can't judge from a lesson observation whether a teacher is um, outstanding or requires improvement with any degree of confidence has started to make a change in the sorts of practices we've seen in the system that have have sometimes meant teachers feel less empowered so I think there's some positive shifts like that around research as well I was quite interested in a, a blog post that David Didow wrote uh, probably probably the end of last year, I can't remember exactly when, that talked about how actually um, maybe lesson observations or offset observations could be more about leading into professional conversations where where teachers are talking about why they're doing what they're doing, making reference to research and things like that, rather than this judgment on teaching and learning that had historically been the case. I suppose the second thing that I was thinking about is social media. I think that's been hugely powerful in teachers feeling more empowered that actually it takes you outside of your classroom outside of your school to engage with a much wider group of professionals across the whole country across the whole world um that means that teachers are sort of connecting they're sharing with each other um in a way that wasn't possible before that sometimes you start to realize all the way it's being done in my school or the way that i've always done it is not the only way that this can be um and it's also driven a whole range of grassroots activities, things like uh, Research Ed, things like Brew Ed, the Cogsci Sci Group, New Voices, a whole range of kind of events and uh, and movements that are about teachers' voices, that are about sort of making a difference for, for teachers led by themselves rather than imposed uh, by either leadership or by external bodies. And that really, I think, helps this sense of empowerment. Um, and I guess I would also hope that the Chartered College is an important part of that we're really focused on giving teachers a voice in policy, connecting teachers into policy. We've run various uh, focus groups and things like that that have been informing what DFE are doing with some of their uh, recent developments. We're also supporting teachers to access research, which, as I've sort of already discussed, is something that I think can be really helpful in increasing teachers' confidence and teachers' sense of uh, control and empowerment. In terms of sort of evidence-based practice, where do you tend to sort of source what's uh, coming through research? Um, well, I guess, you know, always keeping an eye on what's coming through from the Education Endowment mm. Foundation. And we've been uh, partners in uh, a couple of EF um, research trials. So um, I could say say a bit about about those but kind of yeah keeping an eye on 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 EF um really like the work of the educate team mm. at UCL and and the wider um knowledge lab at UCL I think really interesting work um Rose Luckin's team in particular um but also in in relation to a kind of media and technology the work of Andrew Byrne and John Potter um, in the knowledge lab so kind of always keeping an eye on interesting things that they're doing um, actually there's a great new um, report that that was published by the Nuffield Foundation mm. uh, written by Angela McFarlane and um, Professor ah. Angela McFarlane. yeah who's been <laughs> been uh, um, in, insightful in this area for, for, for many years um, and she's kind of pulled together um, kind of research questions around the kind of tensions facing us in in kind of digital technology and um, lots of great references in there and she particularly references the work of um, Steve Higgins at Durham mm. so yeah there are great people doing really interesting work and then yeah other other people I kind of always keep an eye on um uh Neil Selwyn at, at Monash University in 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 Australia so on my my reading list is his um should robots replace teachers fantastic suggestions yeah I saw um Angela McFarlane on a on a panel it's been about three four months ago and I think she pretty much um summed up you know the benefits of uh, digital learning um, in the most concise way possible uh, over three years of doing these interviews so yeah I was really I hadn't um, met her or, or kind of come across her work before then but I found 
what she was saying was very impactful. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she's 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 great. She's sort of full, full of insights, and I would really recommend that report, which is the um, the Nuffield Foundation Growing Up Digital report, where she she really kind of grapples with some of those those questions and um, and, and and then looks at things like professional development and the curriculum and um, where we need to be developing uh, more research to really um, get the answers. It's incredibly important, but there's, there's, there's a huge rider over the top of how important it is. It's current research, educational thinking, ideas, policies, uh, things that you can buy off the shelf only work if they work for your school. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've seen quite a few schools that want to be the next big thing, that want to buy the next big thing, want to try the, the new theory that's come in. Yet some schools put that in without due consideration of um, what matters to them because a, a school's needs change staff changes even Ofsted have changed recently about what what you're looking at so if you are going to be research-based and theory driven your staff need to understand the current needs of your school so that they can pick and choose we, we call it tottingtonizing things so <laughs> Um, I think in the early days, it was a few senior leaders that were very research based and would try and plug into social media and to educational blogs and papers and reading and would try and filter that down from the top down. Um, That has limited success. I think it it worked at the time. The school was in RI and needed direction. We're now in 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 an incredible position where most of the staff are plugged into social media and to educational thinking. But they don't just bring it in and deliver it. They they listen, they consider, they tottingtonize, and then they deliver it at their staff meetings. And I think that's the most important thing that no matter what position you are in your career or where you stand in the school, if you understand the school's current school improvement priorities or needs, you can take all that theory and you can do the sifting before it gets to uh, the discussion of, is this right for us? And it's it's incredible to come to one of my staff meetings now where, where I have the whole staff team discussing this type of content, but understanding whether it fits in our school. Because having 30 people in a room talking about a current theory and whether it will fit with our school is better than one person going on a course and bringing it back and then mm. trying to put it in place because it, it's real to everybody and everybody's had um, a part of shaping it, I suppose, so that we know it's going to stick. And I mean, you, you've had the benefit also of, um, you know, working across various uh, geographies or, you know, different educational landscapes, I suppose. Um, I just wondered if you could elaborate on how you've seen that play out in some of the different settings that you've had the chance to be in. It, it does differ in different geographies and, of course, different cultures. Um, some countries we see buying on a huge scale and implementing um, on a large scale. In other places, we see purchases taking place on a smaller scale and we see good pockets of um, small pockets of good practice. Um, but we find that wherever it is on the globe, if it's accompanied by a professional development program and some good support, that's really when we see the technology having a real impact. And that is the same wherever you are on the planet. Um, It's not the only way that we see impact, but we find that where our users have invested in any kind of PD, be that self-guided or directed, then the technology is more likely to be used in a way that cuts workloads, um, fosters efficiencies, and then ultimately drives the improvement in educational outcomes that everybody's looking for. Stephen and Deirdre took us through a few projects, hoping to identify resources and strategies which actively support teaching and learning. Yeah, there's, there's, there's something that we're, we're piloting this year as well to, to try and reinforce the, the need for research-based thinking. So our school improvement plan, like most schools, has got its direction and the curriculum leaders in our primary school now know what that direction is. What we haven't stipulated is how we're going to get there um, or how much money, because usually when when in the past when I've written a school improvement plan, you design your budget then and you decide who's doing it then and you decide what they're going to do then, which it's okay uh, and it's worked for us, but we're trying to push that back into the whole community so 
we're piloting this year where instead of the SLT deciding and designing all of that, we've given general direction in our school improvement plan, but then it's over to the teachers, it's over to the curriculum leads. So we know that there's going to be a history project in the next 12 months. But what will happen now is that the history lead with people around her, her history team, will come to SLT and will pitch us very much like Dragon's Den. So she will come and the only prerequisite to, to this Dragon's Den meeting is that she's research based. So she will come with a piece of research and say, right, I've done the digging. I've seen this. This is what I think will work for our school. It's a history uh, innovation. And, and I want to put this in this year. And I think it meets the school improvement plan. And then the Dragons, the SLT, will see if it fits with the school direction and together we will make a decision and we then commission that job. We give money to it and we decide what money is appropriate. We give time, we give resources in terms of people um, to make sure that that project is successful and we have a mentor within the SLT who will follow that project through so that really, firstly, it's research-based. Secondly, it's run by everybody rather than being top-down, which which has worked in the past, but we're, we're beyond that now. Most importantly, we know that it's going to have impact because it's it's been based in research, but it's been, again, Tottingtonized. So we know it's going to be uh, benefiting our local community and the, well, the way that our, our school community is, um, is made up. So we hope, I, I mean, it, it's going to be incredible. I want to kind of sit on a chair with a stack of money as well and just hand it over like a dragon would, but... I think the idea that my teachers and even my teaching assistants and HLTAs have now the access to come and pitch an idea and have that commissioned and have support and those move through that journey together rather than it being led by SLT is what I think is, is a really interesting innovation. And hopefully in 12 months time, uh, we can have another conversation and I'll let you know how it's gone. So how we got connected uh, was through a project you're running called Selfie. Um, so I wondered right. if you could just talk a little bit around what that is and and how it's connected also to teaching and learning. Absolutely. So Selfie in a nutshell, it's a free online tool that we've developed to help schools see where they're at in embedding technology into teaching and learning. So it's uh, available for any school anywhere in the world to use. It takes a few minutes to sign up. And in a nutshell, what Selfie does is it takes a snapshot or a, or a selfie on how the school is doing and strengths and weaknesses in embedding technology into teaching and learning. And it does that through asking a series of questions and statements to the teaching staff, so to the teachers, to the school leaders, and also to the students as well. So it takes between around 20 minutes and 30 or 30 minutes to complete. And the questions are uh, focused on different areas of school life and practice. So, for example, leadership is in there, questions on leadership, infrastructure, of course, which is vital. Also on teacher professional development as well and on student digital skills. So it's a mix of questions across six different areas. And the tool is available right now in 31 languages. So that might be of interest to your listeners as well. It's completely free. And at the end of all of this, so it collects the views and the insights from the school community on technology use. And at the end of all of that, there's a report which is generated automatically for the school. And the school from that report gets data, views, insights into what's working well and what's working less well in the school. And this can be a great basis to kick off a kind of conversation and discussion around technology use and develop a, an improvement plan as well. So to focus maybe on one or two areas that need that need improvement and selfie can be run on a regular basis so for example a school could complete a selfie every year uh, and then they can look to see where the improvements are being made or not and where more action is needed um, and another thing to mention is that uh, selfie is a very modular tool as well mm. so it consists of um, a series of statements common to any school using selfie so these core statements and then there's optional statements so if the school wants to run selfie, it sets up the tool, it drags and drops these op optional statements. And I think what's interesting as well is that the school can add up to 10 questions themselves. So say, for example, they've been doing a module on robotics or an online safety and they feel there aren't enough questions on that. They can add questions, questions themselves. So it's a, a modular tool. I think that's important to say because, of course, context and needs are completely different. 
So certainly in terms of the report that's generated from the school, that's completely for the school and for the school only. So that report that's automatically generated, that stays within the school, unless the school chooses to share it, mm-hmm. for example, with, with the neighbouring school. But that's that's really for themselves. And um, I suppose school systems are really different, of course. I mean, you know that even within some countries, school systems are organised on a regional basis. But I think the challenges are really similar when it comes to embedding technology into teaching and learning. If you look across Europe, nearly every country now has a strategy on digital education, maybe specifically for schools or in a lifelong learning perspective. But I think there's a general acceptance and an acknowledgement that it's a, a challenge really to embed mm-hmm. technology in a pedagogically meaningful way. Um, and I think there's certainly consensus across Europe that a tool like Selfie can help the schools reflect on where they're at in the journey and looking not just at infrastructure, which I think maybe the early digital strategies that we had in education were very IT driven, very infrastructure driven, but there's certainly a consensus that in order to be effective, technology needs to be dealt with from different angles, including the the teacher training, for example, looking at assessments, so how we're using technology to measure learning in different ways, um, and where the innovation is as well. And I think leadership is a key piece too. We know that we can only have effective policies on on digital uh, strategies within schools but there's a strong vision and leadership as well so I think um, although systems and setups are different I think there's certainly a consensus around the complexity of embedding technology Mm. and how you need to take this holistic approach. And and we were having a a great chat yesterday where you mentioned that um, you know it's interesting to see some of the Ministry of Education's uh, departments Mm. coming together knowledge sharing around Mm. which policy levers might help in certain areas and um, addressing quite down to a sort of granular level it seemed. Mm. Yeah no absolutely Uh, as well as Selfie in our team we also run a network of of ministries of education and also NGOs working in the education space non-formal education social partners as well and our our group, our expert group, it's called uh, Delta, so Digital Education, Learning, Teaching and Assessment. And we meet about every two months, either online, face to face, so we do study business as well. And we're trying to unpack all this, you know, complexity of digital education and zoom in on, on certain areas. So with the group, we focused on um, gaming in education as well, how we can use games to innovate teaching and learning. We looked at computational thinking because that's been integrated in lots of curricula across Europe as well. Learning analytics, so data. Uh, recently we had a meeting on digital leadership as well so actually Selfie as a tool grew up under the watch of this group and it was really something that came from the group because Mm. you know the ministries of education of course they they need to put in place those top-down strategies and they need to put in place you know whether it's infrastructure or teacher training and really create the kind of climate for innovation but I think where, where Selfie really gets interesting for them is it allows the schools themselves to be the unit of change and it gives schools something very practical and very easy to use and easy to set up and something that they can act on immediately. So I think it helps foster that school level innovation as well. So we've had great um, support from the ministries and many of them are doing a lot of awareness raising around Selfie. In Serbia, for example, they're running a big teacher training program on how to use Selfie to improve teaching and learning. Um, in uh, Slovenia, they have a lot of uh, training courses for school leaders, for example, as well. In Flanders, here in Belgium, they've developed a series of video guides on selfie use as well. And they've um, shared some testimonies of schools that have used it as a planning tool and how they've uh, acted on the results that they, they get through the selfie report. So there's great, there's great support and great buy-in. And, and selfie is used in different ways in different countries, depending on what's there already. I mean, some countries already have existing tools so so self-reflection tools that they've had for a while like in Finland with the Opica tool so what's nice about Selfie is that as a ministry you can uh, take it and use it as you want in Cyprus they integrate it into their innovative schools program for example we launched Selfie a year ago and we've had half a million users until now in 45 different countries. What's interesting as well is the department that you work within for this project, I think you were collaborating also with colleagues in the research department. Um, That's right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think what what makes digital policies interesting and also challenging is they often cut cut across different departments. Right. I think that's the same at national and regional level as well. So to develop the selfie project, we linked up with our research team, and they're based in Spain. Actually, they're not here in Belgium. They're based in Sevilla, in Spain. And the, the origins of Selfie really came from a conceptual framework that we worked on together 
on educational organizations in the digital age and this you know idea of the holistic approach and not just being infrastructure focused um, so we developed this this model this conceptual framework and it, it looked at these six different areas that I mentioned earlier like leadership and like assessment and what does it mean to be kind of digitally fit as a school or as a university so we worked on that with the research department so the origins of selfie really came in a solid piece of research work that we co-designed with our with our working group um, and from that actually we had a request from our uh, from our countries that we work with to to develop something more practical so to take this conceptual module um, this conceptual framework and develop something practical for schools so that was really the the origins of selfie and we started off actually it was more like an experimental kind of pilot and we thought that maybe we'd, we'd run a beta test in four countries but uh, our partner countries were so interested we ended up testing in 14 countries in 2017 um, in 650 schools so you know in our heads it was going to be just a small test but it ended up being a, being a really big test which was great for us because we got a lot of feedback on the early versions and we were able to make the interface easier to use, the question simpler as well. So that beta testing really, really helped us improve. So yeah, it's been a nice collaboration and we've worked as well with our employment department um, because Selfie is uh, available for any upper primary school to use. So from the age of, of nine years up, we recommend so upper primary, secondary, of course, and also vocational education and training schools too. And to adapt the questions for vocational education and training, we worked with our colleagues in the employment department. So it's been a nice you know, collaboration exercise for us as well. Importantly, school leader Stephen stresses the need to pilot teaching and learning strategies and resources before fully embedding in order to build a proper use case before budgets get spent. Here he is talking about the project Unchained Teaching. What's the role of technology in empowering teaching and learning? So where have you seen it be useful and where perhaps less so? Um, in, in our current setting, we, we've tried to change our educational philosophy. And um, I think we're, we're using technology to do that. We, myself and another teacher will be talking soon um, down in London about one of our um, pilots that we're doing at the minute, which we're calling Unchained Teaching. We've, we've had a look at the research and particularly some research done by Salford University and uh, Nightingale Associates, who are um, a firm of architects. Um, realize that the actual structure of a classroom can have a real impact on the progress of primary school children. It was it was it was led by Salford. It was it was done with Blackpool local authority, and they found that. And you can read the study yourself. That up to twenty five percent improvement can be made in children's progress if you just consider the environment in which the children learn. And it seems straightforward. They looked at the design of the building, the orientation of the room. Uh, natural light, noise, the temperature, uh, and the air quality in the room. And it seems straightforward that, well, of course, the way that children feel in a room are going to impact how well they learn. Yet we've had the same classroom design for hundreds of years. It's not really changed since Victorian times. The idea that the teacher is at the front and that there is a board in which they will use to impart their knowledge, that children, are they might be in groups now, they might not be in rows, but largely they're on one side of the room and the teacher with the knowledge is on the other side of the room. That teacher can't really move because they need that board. It might not be chalk now. It, it could be a whiteboard pen. It might even be a digital pen or a finger. But you still chain to the front of the room. And the more we thought about this and the more that, it, that, that we looked at how teachers actually need to be where they're needed most, and that's with the children, assessing the work, making sure the behaviour's okay, uh, making sure that children feel supported. You can't do that from the front. You can't be chained. So we we were piloting, or we've been doing this now for 12 months, that the theory of unchained teaching does need technology. So we've unchained our teachers. It meant that we had to purchase iPad Pros and um, iPad Pens because I wanted them to still be able to use the boards that were in the room, but I wanted that to happen with the children, not in front of. So now my teachers are in and amongst the children. They will teach from the back. They could teach from the side. They may allow a child to teach from where they're sat using um, their iPad and an iPad pen. But we're also trying to push the technology of sound because if you're going to be in the middle of the room, um, you need to be heard everywhere because you will have at some point your back to people. So we're very lucky enough to be trialing um, some technology called the, the Juno by Front Row, which the teachers wear a lanyard and it projects their voice around the room. 
Now, I appreciate that some of your listeners may not have a technology budget for, for and we also have, uh, we're, we're trialing multiple screens in rooms as well, so that, um, as, as my colleague Simon Hunt says, there's no cheap seats. He, he refers to going yeah. to the theatre and you, the, the seats get cheaper the further back you go. And a classroom can be like that. You don't hear as well. You can't see as well if you're at the back. So we're trying to put screens around the room so that no child feels like they're in a cheap seat. Um, we're, we're, we're actually going back to, uh, to looking at the, the, the globe theatre design, a theatre in the round. You look at the Colosseum. You know, we've been entertaining people for thousands of years, yet it's rare that the entertainers, whether they be gladiators, teachers or actors, are at the front and everybody else is, is just facing in one direction. Look at Wembley Stadium. People, we, we've designed entertainment to be around the action. And let's be honest, particularly in a primary school, the best way children will learn is when they're happy and having fun. So it is a bit like having to be entertained. That knowledge will stick if children feel entertained. So let's put the teachers in the middle again. We need technology to do that. We've been very lucky that we've got Promethean screens in school, but we do and we can just buy the cheapest of monitors and have them close by. We've gone to charity shops. We, we look at ways to find technology that other schools or other businesses don't need anymore. And we have those screens so that people can see. So our idea of unchained teaching and no cheap seats is using technology, not necessarily in the way that it was designed. Some of these boards are designed so that we stood next to them. And that would be one of my tips for the use of tech is don't always think you have to use it in the way that it was <laughs> told to you in the brochure. But we're trying our very best that tech is in the background. You can tell that this theory is tech heavy, but what is the, the focal point of it is that the teacher, the one with the knowledge, the one that can make the difference is within the classroom and is right next to the children, giving that assessment, that verbal reassurance, making sure that they are where, where they need to be in every lesson. So that's the way we're using technology and um, we're using it, you know, to try and look differently at the way that the classroom is designed, even though a lot of the tech would, would, would almost tie you back into the traditional way. We're trying to think outside the box and use the same tech innovatively to, to, to have impact. Yeah, I love that as well. The, the simple idea of um, even using audio, because I, I remember way back when, but um, being in a classroom and, you know, if you were in those cheap seats and you can't quite hear and you're, you know, perhaps you need a little bit of extra help to get a concept anyway, and then you just start to switch off, don't you? Because you think, well, I can't hear, this is stupid. <laughs> like, you know, and, and your, your kind of interest just wanes. So um, that's really great to hear. Um, the front row junior Juno stuff is, is, is designed exactly for that. So we're very lucky to be trialing that in one classroom. But next door, uh, the teachers just got our radio mic that we use for our performances, a Bluetooth speaker. Um, on wheels and he's put that strategically in the room so he's trying the same theory at a fraction of the cost to see if the the theory works because once we can show that it has impact and fingers crossed if we can get 25 percent as the um, the university of Salford said in their study that would be amazing then we can start to think of holistic investment in these products but as a pilot you don't have to go to the top end to try to, to see whether these things work so to end this week's episode, our guests give their final shout outs and resource recommendations for you, the listeners, to get stuck into all around empowering teaching and learning. I find that I really am inspired when I see teachers and students using technology in the classroom. So currently we're working with London Design and Engineering University Technology College who use such a wide range of solutions and they're making a really big difference to their students. And I see how rewarding academically and vocationally that, that can be for students mm. and teachers. And I'm also inspired by some of the organisations that provide relevant digital resources for teachers and schools, aiming to make um, life much easier for our teachers in classrooms. Most recently, I've, I've been looking at some of the National Literacy Trust resources mm. available on their website for teachers to download and they've got several um, inspiring programs that provide free digital lesson plans, activities, video content, all sorts of materials that are suitable for use within the classroom, um, you know, designed to inspire learning across, uh, across different curriculum areas. 
And they're also working with the Premier League and um, have created some resources for the Reading Stars programme. And on a very practical level, we've been working with Mark Robinson from the Learning Partnership in Promethean Classrooms across the country to develop programmes that support the use of our technology and to enable teachers to use solutions that model and develop STEM-based activities. Um, So we've been working in primary and secondary classrooms across the UK and the materials that have been created really are um, inspiring. They're very exciting and we'll be showcasing some of those materials on the stand at BET later in January. So um, probably it's bad to be self-promoting, but I can't help but mention probably the most interesting thing I think here, uh, which is entirely contributed to by amazing authors around the world. So really, it's no credit to me at all, is something um, that a colleague and I edited recently, which is a report on uh, the sort of trends in teacher CPD internationally. We initially imagined that it was just going to be a handful of articles looking at some different directions, but it's ended up being, um, I think, 196 pages of all sorts of different uh, angles around teacher development, um, which includes things around the importance of sort of school culture in enabling teachers to develop um, with contributions from people like uh, Kraft and Pape, who wrote a very seminal paper around professional culture a few years ago. Um, It's also got people like Sam Sims and Harry Fletcher Wood talking about how we can uh, gauge the effectiveness of teacher CPD. It's got people like Dylan William talking about um, using research as part of approaches to teacher professional learning. Um, Just a really wide sort of perspective on all of the different ways in which we can develop teachers, uh, different directions that's taking. Um, And I think it's completely free. It's available to download online. I think it's a, a really good starting point for people who are wanting to reflect on teacher practice um there's also a section about teacher professionalism which i think really resonates with the the question around teacher empowerment and autonomy as well yeah i think there's there's lots of good practice across europe Um, it's really nice to be uh, at the center of that network that's sharing all this experience and there's a huge willingness for countries and ministries of education to share i mean i'm i'm very familiar of course what happens in my own country and i think there's some nice examples there we have a digital learning framework in Ireland and actually all the schools in Ireland work on developing uh, a digital strategy for their school as well Um, and one thing that they've done in Ireland is a team working with our Ministry of Education and they've developed a series of videos which I really like and they go into schools and they uh, talk to staff and students and they really capture very practical examples of what it means to embed technology in the teaching and learning and I think that's really nice so there's a video on for example a sports teacher in primary school and how they use um, how they use digital equipment on uh, the topic of balance, for example, so the kids can record each other balancing and they can see their progress over time. Or it could be a chemistry teacher in secondary education uh, talking about how she brings in uh, maybe online labs or virtual labs uh, for the students to do experiments. So I really like this kind of practical demonstration as well. I think that's very important. I think you know, teachers are, are in the business of teaching and learning. And I think they really need to see what it means for them and, and not just hear in abstract terms about the importance of technology, but to really see how they can embed it in their practice in a, in a pedagogically meaningful way. So one of the things that we've done quite recently is, is um, a couple of different um, editions that have focused on curriculum and curriculum development. Obviously, with an increased focus on that from Ofsted in England, <laughs> ironically, having talked about how Ofsted can, uh, can sometimes uh, uh, drive unhelpful practices, there's, there's obviously been a, a recent focus on curriculum. And um, we've recognised that that's sometimes something that schools didn't feel well equipped to talk about. Again, by and large, schools doing a fantastic job there. But there's a difference between doing something really well, I think, and being able to talk about that confidently, being able to articulate what you're doing. So Mm. um, to help sort of raise the quality of discourse around those areas, we've had two issues on curriculum that have been hugely popular. Um, One looking at the notion of a broad and balanced curriculum and what that might mean in in a primary setting or in a secondary setting. Um, And then the other one looking specifically at ideas and processes around curriculum design. So supporting schools with how they go about thinking about designing curriculum. Um, A huge range of different perspectives there. As always, we try to to balance the very different views about uh, about everything around education to not dictate to teachers what you should be doing, but instead to say, here are some perspectives that can help you to think about what you're doing, different lenses through which you might view the approaches in your school. Um, the other issue that's been hugely popular um, was one that was uh, was last year, one that we did around the science of learning. And I think there's a, a sort of increasing interest in cognitive science and how that 
might uh, might inform practices in schools. So uh, I think that kind of that issue was just of particular interest in in uh, sort of some emerging ideas and trends and a real emerging area of interest. And we keep having people coming back to uh, articles from that. And we similarly in our ed tech issue um, earlier this year, we had some articles around things like cognitive load theory and understanding how technology uh, and how we present things might be informed by um, by our knowledge of cognitive science and that's been really popular our, our most popular articles on that get hundreds and hundreds of views a day of people trying to understand more about this area starting my um my educational path i i did a psychology degree and i originally wanted to get into educational psychology and i i, I did a two-year um I started my teaching career as you had to do back then, and then as soon as I was in a classroom, I could I could never leave. But I think that 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 love of understanding the human brain and and how people tick has has never left me really. So my research, and I'd like to think a lot of the things that I do on my training days are about the human brain, why we act like we do. Let's be honest, education is not an easy game to be in. It's stressful. It can be difficult at times the workload and well-being agenda is really high at the minute and there's a reason for that it's because it's a really difficult job to do but i think if you if you can start to understand your human reaction to stress and why you do what you do why do you get really angry when that but when that particular parent rings you why can't why can't you do certain things on a certain day then if you understand your own brain and try to get your staff to understand the way they feel i think understanding yourself and hopefully using a bit of research to help you with that can really make you understand why you act the way you do. And for me, um, the chimp paradox, Professor Steve Peters, that, that I read last year was a real eye opener for me for why I do have a chimp and he does try to get out all the time. <laughs> but understanding why you react the way that you do and that it's kind of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution that has, has made you react the way that you do means that you can control that and you can you can let the real person that you want to be control the way that you are. So I think that book was incredible. And as we look into 2020, what changes might make a difference? So um, obviously we had quite a, an interesting night last night in terms of uh, sort of uh, the direction <laughs> of the nation, all, the, all these things. Um, politics aside, if you were to... Um, you know, have a magic wand and think about, you know, what on the very top level um, could in, could in help empower teaching and learning. So if there were any kind of policy level changes or levers that you could pull, what would you love to see more of um, that would help support teachers and, and learners in turn? I, as you've said, a very, very interesting night last night. I think I, I try my very best in in, in my daily life to, to try and separate what yeah. comes from politics or government to, to what my children actually need. We are given frameworks uh, in education. We always have been. And I guess those frameworks are, are the answer to your, to your question. We, it could be a local authority framework that we're expected to squeeze into. It could be a Ofsted box. It could be a, a new curriculum or a government-led um, initiative or theory that we have to follow. All these frameworks have to be considered, but if you follow them 100%, you run the risk of not creating a curriculum or a, a feeling in the building that's right for, for the community that you serve. And I think Ofsted is, is showing the best move in that recently in, in their new framework, that it, it's gone away from um, trying to prove yourself as a school and, and, and Ofsted are trying to be much more of an improvement body and giving schools the freedom to innovate with their curriculum. You still have to justify why you're choosing, why you're doing this and why you're doing it now. You still have to prove that it's that it's been created well, that you are implementing it well and that it has impact. I fully understand that, but the freedom now is there so that schools can innovate to best meet the needs of their children. So I guess in answer to your question, my magic one moment would be that every framework that schools feel that they need to fit into is one that's designed with freedom for schools to do what they know is best and with flexibility so that people can try and pilot, maybe get things wrong, but can improve because of it. And I still go to a lot of meetings and a lot of briefings that help you with Ofsted 
that tell you, if you do this, it will tick that box. And if you can do this, it will do that. And, and those things have always worried me because mm. I think school leaders and school teachers know what their children need. Good schools, good teachers and good leaders know exactly what their schools need, what they need. What I want the frameworks that they work to, to understand is, is that the frameworks and the schools can work together to get the best for, for schools rather than schools feeling that they have to tick boxes because we have been in the past in a place where school have definitely done things just to tick a box or to prove something to someone else. And that's a really dangerous place to be when children deserve an education that's based around their needs, their community, and what will give them the best life chances based on, on, on where they live. So fingers crossed with, with, with the great strides that, that, um, that Ofsted have made in, in trying to turn things around so that we can just tell the story of, of our schools rather than try to fit what we think they want to hear. Let's hope that this, this government and, and all frameworks that academies and local authority schools are, are, are within start to understand that this working together to improve schools is much better than being judged and having to prove yourself. That's all for this week. Thank you so much for listening in and huge thank you to all of my guests and Beth for supporting this series. Don't forget, if you'd like to continue the conversation online, use the hashtag EdTechPodcast and hashtag Bet2020 or go to the Twitter account at Podcast EdTech or at BetShow on all the social medias. Or for all the show notes, including resource and reading recommendations, it's the EdTechPodcast.com. Many of this week's guests are taking part in the Bet 2020 programme. Go to betshow.com to dig out timings and register for the event in January. The EdTech Podcast will also be recording our last episode of the series on skills live at the arena. Thanks again to Promethean for sponsoring this week's episode. A quick word from them before we end. This podcast episode is sponsored by Promethean. With more than 20 years experience in education, Promethean is a global leader in education technology. The Active Panel Elements series of interactive flat panels combined with Promethean educational software offer a truly collaborative and connected approach to teaching and learning through EdTech. Promethean Active Panel, designed to save valuable teacher time and improve learning outcomes. Learn more about Promethean at www.prometheanworld.com forward slash GB. That's all for now. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. It's been lovely speaking to you. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Safe travels back. Bye.